Hey everybody, uh, today I was asked to talk about being mad at the church and being mad at God. So let me just tackle the easy one, okay? And I say the easy one because the church is an institution. And that means you can't be mad at it. The church has not hurt anyone. The reality is someone at a church has hurt someone or a group of people. And you can be mad at that person, you can be mad at that group, but the church itself has not hurt you. For instance, let's say I go to McDonald's every single day and I order french fries. And I love McDonald's french fries, they don't even need ketchup. I just sit there and eat them all day long. Let's suppose one day when I go to order them, the cashier is rude to me. Let's say another day I go and I get cold fries. Now, am I going to be mad at every single McDonald's in the entire world? No. <laughs> am I going to say, well, they're never going to get my money again? No. McDonald's did nothing to me as an institution, right? If someone comes up to you and says they are mad at the church, I think that's the time to ask a question and to probe a little deeper to see what happened. Where does this anger come from? Because the truth is going to come out that someone at the church hurt them or a group of people at the church. Could even be the pastor, could even be leadership. But when someone comes up to you and says that they're mad at the church, they're really mad at a person. So first I would say, you need to listen to their story, right? Before you make any judgments, before you get defensive, you need to listen to their story. Sometimes I think people just need to vent. And as a member of a church, don't take it personally. Just allow that person to get it out. Listen to honor their story and to offer any empathy that you can. If this individual feels hurt by a church or they feel hurt by how leadership handled a situation, you want to understand why so that you can serve them. And the second thing I would say after they tell their story, apologize. Apologize. In our example, I would say something like, Mrs. Smith, I'm so sorry. What you experienced was wrong. And honestly, it sounds like someone at that church messed up or they dropped the ball. And I completely understand why you're frustrated. And in your situation, I would probably feel the same way. And sure, this isn't about your church and you probably aren't the staff member who made the mistake or the decision that they feel hurt by. But at this time, you represent the church to them. And so offering a heartfelt apology can go a long way to breaking down those walls. An apology will make the other person feel valued and understood and heard. That's a big deal. And I think it'll go a long way towards healing. And then I would just say, you know what? You, had, you want to end in prayer, right? You want to release that tension and you want to pray. I think the final step to that process to all the tension that stories like this and, and uh, um, the history that we have sometimes creates that tension, you got to let it go through prayer. You, you've listened, you have, you've apologized, and now we're going to let those feelings go. We're going to give those feelings over to God. Which takes us to our much bigger topic, being mad at God. Being mad at God. Now, I've got to believe that at some point in everybody's life, we've all raised our fist or shouted in anger or cried tears of, of why God and been angry at God. I think most of us, if not all of us, have done it. At one time in our life, I would say, you know what, it's normal. It's normal for us to be mad at God. Maybe your parent died or you had a friend who got seriously sick or they even were killed. Uh, maybe you got a serious sickness, disease, cancer, or, or a handicap. These and other issues 
They're very serious. They come into our life, and when they do, they make it very easy for us to target God for our pain. Anger is a normal human response. If I can be mad at an inanimate object, like a hammer, when I hit my finger, right? I can certainly be mad at God when my grandmother passes away. After all, what is anger? Anger is a human emotion. It's a response to a situation that's either out of my control or out of my ability to understand, or both. So I mentioned a few. What are some reasons do you think that we are typically mad at God about? Um, I think the first is when we don't get something we want, right? We expected it to go this way, and it didn't. We expected that thing we were praying for to come true, and it didn't. You have really wanted a relationship with someone, or you really wanted that job, and you said, that job's perfect for me. And when it doesn't work out, when it doesn't go the way you expect, you get hurt, you get disappointed, and because, you know, God is in charge of all things, then our first impulse is to send our complaint up the corporate ladder, and you complain to the one who's in charge, right? You complain to God. And when we don't get something we want in prayer, or we don't get something that we expect, maybe you'd say, well, I don't get angry. I don't get angry. Maybe I'm just disappointed. Okay, but disappointment is a mild form of anger. We usually don't connect the two because when we're disappointed, I think we equate that more with sadness. Like, oh, I'm sad that I didn't get what I wanted. But anger often begins as this sense of betrayal. And disappointment comes from that. Anger usually starts with that why question. Why didn't God do this? Why did God allow this? Why didn't God give me X? But the harsh reality is we won't get answers. God doesn't owe us any explanation. Just like when you were young and your parents didn't always give you what you wanted, right? And if someone expresses to you that things didn't go the way they expect, that's probably a good time to share your own story. I'm sure we all have a story about a time when life didn't go the way we expected. We didn't get the life that we wanted. Of course, the flip side to not getting something we want is we get something that we don't want. Usually, it's suffering. When something bad happens to someone we love, or to us, or someone gets really sick, or even dies, we wonder why these things happen. Because we tend to think of God being this big genie in the sky who should only give us good things and he should protect us from all the bad things. Some people wonder why their life ends up a certain way and when it does, they blame God for it. Because, you know, if God really cared about me, then he wouldn't let me suffer. We think if God is so loving, why am I in pain? Is he punishing me? Is he allowing horrible things to happen to me? Is he allowing horrible things to happen to the people I love or, or the world? Well, we don't have to look very far in the Bible. James 1 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Romans 5 says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. The Bible never promises you a stress-free life. Never promises you that you will not experience trials. In fact, it's the opposite. Ever since Genesis, God has told us that we live in a broken world, that we live in a world of sin. And the world isn't going the way God wants either. 
The reality is everyone gets sick. Everyone dies. Everyone will take their turn with pain and suffering. Everyone. I think the anger comes though when we compare our lives with others. So whereas it might be normal for us to lose a child or to lose a spouse or to lose a parent, when we look around, we don't see other people experiencing that. How come this person didn't lose their child? How come it was me? How come this person didn't lose their spouse? How come it was me, right? Why did God pick me? How come me, not them? But again, God does not owe us an explanation or an answer. There are no answers for these questions. We like to ask why, but there is no answer for why. We live in a cause and effect world, and so we expect the world to go that way. We expect everything to go that way. If I drive safely, I won't get into an accident. If I save my money, if I spend my money frugally, then I will have money in the bank. Cause, effect. So, then we expect that if I act good, if I live a good life, then cause, effect, God will reward me with a good life, with a trial-free, stress-free life. We think that God owes us something. When we experience a trial, it makes us feel like God's punishing us, or God forgot us, or God doesn't care about us. I mean, come on, after all, after all the prayers I've prayed, after all the times I've gone to church, after all the times I've given in the collection plate, and you didn't heal my brother's cancer, and you didn't give me the job that I wanted, how come? After all I've done for you. Hmm? Cause, effect. We get angry when we think God owes us something, when in fact, God owes us nothing. If we think that God is gonna be our genie in the bottle and make everything good in our lives, then we're always gonna be mad at God when something bad happens. But having faith in God, that's not an insurance policy that bad things will never happen. In the Bible, Jesus says in John chapter 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace and in this world you will have trouble. That's a guarantee from Jesus' own mouth. In the world, you will have trouble. Romans 8 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. We are promised suffering in this present time. The reward, the thing that God owes you, is not in this life. It's in the next it's in the glory that it will be revealed to you. And I know, even though life, sometimes you and I, we can see it as this amazing gift, right? We, we do, we can recognize it and we say, man, this is something to be celebrated. Yes, but alongside that, there will always be seasons of pain, seasons of difficulty, seasons of disappointment. It just will. But for those of us who've placed our faith in God and we're on this journey of faith, we just know that things won't always go well. But when I think something unexpected arises, something difficult, and we start to wonder, okay, where did God go? Isn't God supposed to have my back? Did, did God take the day off? How do we address that? How do we process that? How do we heal? And if you have a care receiver, if you have a friend or someone who's talking to you about this, how do you help them? Well, I think first you need to let them know that anger with God is normal. It's normal. It, 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 it'd be very rare for a believer to say that they were never angry with God. As much as we might not like to admit it, most of us have been unhappy with God about something some direction our life took. So I would just say, you know what? If you're feeling angry with God, you're not alone. One of the most famous verses about anger is Ephesians 
be angry, it says. Be angry, but do not let your anger lead you to sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. It's a very, uh, very important verse. And it has some great things for you to know about being angry, right? And not just angry with God, but anger in general. First, this verse affirms that anger is normal, right? And it's almost permission. It says, be angry. Be angry. Yes, there are injustices in the world. Absolutely. There are injustices. You should feel angry. Anger in itself is not a sin. If people ask you or your care receiver asks you, is it a sin to be angry? It's not a sin to be angry. But it's the way we respond to anger, right? The passage says, do not let your anger lead you to sin. So there's something that comes out of that. Your, your parents understood that you got angry as a child, right? And probably angry at them. Angry at their rules, angry at their punishment, angry at their curfew. You can probably remember being angry at your parents, but your parents were wise enough and mature enough to take it. They didn't punish you for being angry. God is even more wise and even bigger. So he can take anything that you dish out. You can be mad at God. He is not mad at you. Second, you help them understand that being angry is a process. It's not just going to go away overnight. The second part of Ephesians 4.26 is a beautiful reminder that we don't suppress our emotion. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have some self-control. Absolutely, we should have some self-control. But it also says we shouldn't ignore it. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. It lets us know that there is a healthy time to process it, but that process shouldn't go on forever, right? It has, a, it has an ending. It has a finality. Being angry with God takes some time to get over, just like it does with a parent or a friend. So how do you process that anger? That can be a very tricky thing to figure out. Venting our anger with no restraint, that can make things miserable for everybody. But suppressing our anger, that can be damaging to the care receiver, right? So I think this takes us back to the very first point that we had with being mad at the church. We have to listen. We have to listen to their story. Listen to someone's story. Most people agree that if you can articulate what you're angry about, whether it's verbal or whether it's in writing, it's an effective way to process your anger. And it gets you to a place of acceptance. It brings you to a place of peace. And of course, as the listener, we want to be sympathetic. We want to be sympathetic, but I think for healing to begin, we need to help them shift their anger to gratitude. It's hard to be angry when you're thankful. And there are so many more things in this world to be thankful for, right? Gratitude is the antidote to anger. Anger is an incredibly powerful emotion because it's attached to this perceived idea that there is an injustice. And it's an intense emotion and it can quickly lead to an obsession. And then we're constantly thinking about this unfairness that we're experiencing. And if we don't check it or address it, it can take over all our thoughts and it can lead us into this kind of conspiracy theory life where we think that everything's out to get us or that life doesn't go well for us or this kind of thing always happens to me. But a practice that really keeps that anger in perspective is gratitude. Being thankful for things daily, verbalizing or writing down the things that we're thankful for. Helping your care receiver uh, make a gratitude journal or remembering to thank God in their prayers. So for as much as they're verbal about the things that they're angry about, we want them at the same time to remember all the good, all the things that there are in life to be thankful about, the good things in life. It, like I said, anger is normal. It's a natural response for believers, for non-believers. It, it, it's part of suffering. 
But we need to work through that anger and arrive at a place of peace, acceptance. We have to remember to trust in God again. It's completely normal to feel disappointment, even angry at God. But you and I probably would have both agree that it's always been the valleys. It's always been the hard times, the difficult things, the trials, the suffering. Those are the things that usually always bring us closer to God, deepen our relationship with God, help us to lean on God more than before, right? And if you do that, what can you expect from God? Peace, right? We can expect his peace. If we trust in him, believe in him, we will have peace. You start that journey to peace, peace with God, and then comfort, comfort. He promises to be near those who are hurting. As a parent, Psalm 34 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. And his love. Don't we all have a promise of his love? First John says, God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. He loves your heart. God is with you in all things, in every circumstance. The truth is God has not left you. God has not forgotten you. God, God has not abandoned you. And God will give you a life of meaning, of significance. I think if we got everything we ever wanted and we never experienced a trial, never experienced a suffering, we would be spoiled and we would be very selfish people. We would be very inward focused people. God is a wise father and he knows exactly what you need and he will always groom you and grow you through the good times and the bad to be exactly the person that you need to be. I hope that helps. <laughs>